in recent weeks. Uh, and today's report uh, is um, that, that we got today on unemployment was actually the best since the pandemic started. And so what does this mean for small businesses? It means that they could have a hard time competing, uh, that you know, because people are less likely to go work for startup um, companies, and because there's a labor shortage uh, emerging in certain sectors, this could be another headwind for small businesses. Uh, another thing I want to touch on is, is small business formation. So we've seen uh, record small business formation, but we, we have less clear lens on is small business failure. We've also experienced likely the worst year in small business failures in the history of the U.S. Uh, or you know, potentially back to the Great Depression, depending on how you, how you measure it. Uh, and the fact that we have this new business formation isn't particularly reassuring when we look at the composition of uh, many of these businesses. Uh, many of them were done out of necessity as sole proprietorships for people that lost their jobs. There's also second jobs, supplemental jobs, hobby jobs. Um, a lot of them are sort of online retailing type jobs, people selling things online, uh, again, out of necessity. And also many of the jobs are unlikely to be businesses that grow and generate additional jobs. So uh, what we're really seeing is a lot of disruption, a lot of churn in small business, and it's unclear exactly what the prospects are, are gonna be going forward. So in a nutshell, uh, we're, we're seeing, I think, continued large divergences and opportunities based on type of business and industry, the type of owner, um, size of business, to some degree, geography. And these are really the things that we have explored in the trends report and we'll explore in the conference going forward. So um, with that, I'm happy to either answer a question or turn it over to next speaker. Great, thank you, Greg. And we did get a question that just came in. Uh, with so many first time small business owners, what will the challenges and opportunities for helping these new business owners be to succeed? Yeah, I mean, I, I think to the extent that, that you have people who are inexperienced, they're, they're on a steep learning curve and facing a lot of headwinds. So um, providing uh, you know, services that would um, help these companies survive, I think is, is going to be an important part of what folks like you know, the Entrepreneurship Center here at UNC and other centers that, that people involved with the conference are doing, as well as government um, agencies and entities and, and, uh, and think tank support groups. So I think there's gonna be a lot, of, a lot of wood to chop to make sure that uh, emerging new small businesses are able to succeed in the coming years. Fantastic. And second follow-up question is on page 12 of the Trends and Entrepreneurship Report, you talk about the employment impact on early stage ventures with the deterioration in quality of human capital for those companies. What do you think the ongoing or long-term impact of that will be? Yeah, it's, I mean, what's happening in, in the venture space is, is interesting, I think, because you know, there, it's, a, it's a fairly small uh, slice of, of the economy when, when you look at it. So you look at total employment by venture, new venture-backed companies, it's, uh, it's a fairly small percentage of, to of total employment. So the question is, you know, what, what is the long-term impact? It's probably, it's probably a great long-term impact. I mean, we need those highly innovative, high-growth companies. But in the near term, the employment impact tends to be much more limited um, from these because it takes a while for them to get going and, and grow into mid-size and, lar and larger companies. So you know, I, th I think one of the challenges right now that that the broader economy has is, you know, who's going to go work for what type of company and what, what sort of labor constraints is this put into the market? So especially newer, smaller companies are going to have a hard time competing for um, highly skilled people that they might need. So if you're starting a software company, you know, it's a much riskier proposition to go work for um, a small new startup company than it is a large established software company. And this is just a, a constraint that, you know, it, it's always a, a constraint, but right now I think it's a particularly a acute constraint um, for, um, for startup businesses. No doubt. Well, thank you, Greg. Um, at this point, I want to turn things over to our next speaker. We are, I'm just going to remind folks that we are going to take additional questions at the end of today's briefing. So stay tuned. If you didn't get your question answered, uh, we will be fielding those later in the briefing. Um, at this point, I want to turn things over to Professor David T. Robinson. Uh, Professor Robinson is Professor of Finance and the J. Rex Fuqua Distinguished Press Professor of International Management at Duke University's Fuqua School of Business, as well as a research Associate at the National Bureau of Economic Research. David. Thank you, Mackenzie. It's great to be here with, with, with you, with Greg, and with, with everyone else on the panel. I'm really excited about the, 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 the Frontiers of Entrepreneurship Conference that we're about to kick off here in just a few minutes. Um, I'm going to be chairing um, a session beginning at 11 o'clock that's going to start to talk about capital market disparities. Um, 
you know, basically, in a sense, the difference between what we're seeing on Main Street and what we're seeing on Sand Hill Road, to go back to the question that Greg was just, just discussing. Um, I think if, to, to kind of foreshadow what we're going to talk about, I think it's important to kind of take a step back and think about what did the economy look like with respect to racial disparity before the pandemic broke? And to kind of set the table, you know, what, what we saw is we, we had an economy where when you're talking about entrepreneurship, new business formation by uh, black founders and white founders, there were, there were uh, strong disparities. Black owned businesses were starting smaller than white owned businesses. And that's controlling for industry, that's controlling for the geographic location, that's controlling for a whole host of other factors. So it's not just people choosing different types of ideas that require different types of capital. Um, putting all of that to the side, the black, the black business is starting uh, at a smaller scale than the white business. And, and really the, um, the, the, the challenge for, for racial equality in this context is that over time, you do not see convergence um, in, in uh, you do not you, do, you don't see the the racial gap diminish as the businesses sort of gain business traction. Black owned businesses start smaller and continue to persist at smaller sizes. Part of the reason for this, um, and this is something that we found in a, in a in a report that's been recently published in Management Science, is that the that black owned founders anticipate discrimination from banks. And therefore, they, um, they are more likely to say that they did not apply for a loan, even though they needed one. And the reason they didn't apply is they feared that they would be rejected. So setting the stage before the pandemic broke, we were living in a world where there were pronounced capital market disparities between Black-owned entrepreneurs and, and white-owned entrepreneurs. And that was really coming from um, not only the way people were being treated in the capital market, but the way they were expecting to be treated in the capital market. Now the pandemic breaks, and what do we see? Well, we saw, we saw um, actually what looked almost like a little bit of good news where you saw black unemployment rise by less than you would have expected given the nature of the shock. Um, where we saw the biggest damage in unemployment was in the Latinx community. However, what happened is that, that the racial disparities in, in, in unemployment grew over time because there was a, a rebound in employment in May and June, early in the summer, that was much more pronounced in, in white employment and much less pronounced in black and Latinx employment. And so that meant that going into the summer, we were seeing more pronounced racial disparities in employment. You know, we had the payroll protection plan and the, 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 the economic injury disaster loans program. We saw those roll out. Those rolled out in a manner, if you just counted up loans, they rolled out in a manner that was um, pretty fair in terms of hitting minority neighborhoods at about the same rate as, uh, as white neighborhoods. But that's looking at loan counts, not loan sizes. The disproportionate amount of money flowed into white communities, not into, into, into black communities. And also the money flowed later into black communities. So I think the, so the pandemic and our response to the pandemic, in a sense, exacerbated trends that were already present, um, largely for the same reasons that the initial trends were present, that there, there, there are differences in the way uh, communities of color are treated by banks, but also how they expect to be treated by banks. And, 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 and that perpetuates a lot of the problems that, that many people are, are focusing on trying to solve. Um, so I offer that really as just foreshadowing for our first session, which is gonna begin, as I said, just in, in, in a few minutes, you know, 11 o'clock, the top of the hour. Um, Mackenzie, I should probably turn it back to you here. Thanks, David, for that. We got a, a great question that came in. You touched on uh, the exacerbation of inequities that we've seen during the pandemic. Uh, the question that came in is, when it comes to how the pandemic disproportionately affected women and minority business owners, what was a result of pre-existing inequalities and biases, or was there something pandemic-specific that impacted those businesses differently? 
Yeah, that's a great question. And I, I think, I think b- both elements that the, um, both elements raised there are important. I think that the bulk of the reaction is um, a reflection of pre-existing trends. In other words, minority uh, small business owners were much more likely to have a more tenuous relationship with their bank, to have fewer banking relationships and to have less, um, uh, you know, a shorter duration of banking relationships with the banks that they had. And so when you, when you turn it around and look at, at rolling out PPP from the bank's perspective, you know, um, it's, if it costs about the same to process the loans for everyone, you're, you're, going, to, you're going to naturally skew towards larger loans with more established customers whose information is e- sort of e- easier to fold into the, into the loan process. And so that disproportionately, uh, that, that put black and, and women founders, Latinx founders at a disadvantage relative to more established businesses. Um, then I think there's the question of were they operating in sectors where, that were harder hit or were they more disadvantaged? And I think I think that's much that's certainly part of the story, but I think that's a much smaller part of the story than just the presence of the pre-existing conditions. That's helpful, David. And we got a couple of other questions I'm going to save for that open Q&A that we'll be doing at the at the end of the session. Um, but at this point, I want to hand things over to our next speaker, Professor Yael Hochberg. Uh, Yael is the head of Rice University's Entrepreneurship Initiative and the Ralph S. O'Connor Professor in Entrepreneurship and Finance at Rice Business. Yael, thank you so much for joining us. Thanks so much for having me. Um, so I... Uh, uh, My piece in the trends report is really focused on um, something a little bit different than uh, what you've heard about from Professor Robinson Robinson and Professor Brown. Um, A lot of the work that I've been doing recently is really focused on thinking about policy interventions and how we can be supporting innovation-driven entrepreneurship here in the U.S. and how we should be thinking about education towards innovation um, innovation driven entrepreneurship. Um, And in particular, um, one of the issues that um, I've been thinking about Um, recently and that I think we need more thought about in this country is the fact that many of our interventions and programs that have been meant to support entrepreneurs and startups really focus on, you know, support for um, these startups and companies once they actually already exist. And that includes programs that are meant to provide technical assistance and capital grants or to provide tax credits or other incentives for investors to invest in new startups. And, you know, many of these programs are created with the goal of creating entrepreneurial clusters and innovation economy employment in regions that do not have these in abundance and really addressing some of these disparities that we have around who engages in entrepreneurship in this country and who does not. Um, And unfortunately, not as much focus has been really spent on understanding what we need to do to support and encourage the creation of these startups to begin with um, and to understand why it is that we do not see as much of this sort of activity in minority communities um, and in certain regions of the the country, particularly as it pertains to innovation-driven startups and to the commercialization of scientific and engineering breakthroughs um, and fundamental research that's happening every day at our top research universities and national labs. And that is really key to our continued competitiveness um, as a country moving into the future. Um, we often operate in a manner that really assumes that new innovation-driven startups will simply appear from the ether and that the missing pieces support once they emerge. But when we talk about innovation-driven entrepreneurship, particularly in deep and hard tech and in areas that require investment in infrastructure and specialized equipment, um, it actually requires much uh, more support earlier in the process to really bring new discoveries to proof of concept uh, that will actually allow for the formation of startups and the determination of uh, market potential. Um, My latest research that's covered in the trends report provides some strong evidence that private capital markets will actually come and support new innovative startups if we can just do more to help with the translation and transfer of new innovation into the market. And one of the things that we need to be talking about more is whether our support dollars um, could be beneficially spent on thinking about how we help encourage the translation of new scientific discoveries out of universities and to real applications in the market. Um, and there's two big looming gaps here to address, one of which is entrepreneurship education, and the other is funding for translational research that bridges the gap between scientific discovery and market opportunity. Uh, entrepreneurship education at many of our institutions of higher learning in this country is ad hoc or non-existent. 
Um, there are entire communities of underrepresented minorities at HBCUs and MSIs and um, in other areas of our country that really are just never exposed to the concept of entrepreneurship, have no idea how to approach or even consider launching their own ventures if they do have their own ideas. And a lot of the education we do have at the places we do have it has been targeted at business school students, particularly at the graduate level. Um, and often it consists of recounting experiences and examples rather than teaching skills and frameworks as we do with other disciplines. Um, we need more focus on codifying entrepreneurship education in the way that top business schools have done and focusing on commercialization of innovation in particular. Um, and also thinking about education, not just for um, our business school students, but also for graduate students, postdocs, faculty and research staff in the STEM fields. Um, and then finally, um, you know, provision of translational research uh, funding and is going to be critical for maximizing the potential of our federal research dollars and thinking about how American technological competitiveness can stay where it uh, has been in the past um, for the future. There is a big gap between the risk level of basic research discoveries and what the private mar market is really um, able to support. Um, and translational research requires funding and a new class of researcher. Um, but all of this can be done, and there are examples of this um, out there. Um, it can be done in a way that really incentivizes US R1 universities to partner and collaborate with HBCUs and minority serving institutions in their ecosystems in a way that really can support the creation of a new generation of innovation driven entrepreneurs whose makeup, I'd say more closely resembles that of the American population at large. Great, thank you, Yael. The first question tees up um, exactly what you just touched on, which is there's a lack of diversity um, that's kind of particular to some of the fields that you just discussed, such as high tech. What can be done to support and educate underrepresented entrepreneurs in these fields? Yeah, now, you know that's that, that's I think a key piece for us to be thinking about here. Um, you know, part of this I think is exposure. You know, there's some it, we have been thinking about this very very closely and very clearly at Rice. Um, you know, and, and, and trying to think about ways that we can actually think about our ecosystem as a whole and not just as a university. Um, and examples of that are, you know, thinking about how we, how, how we take this translational research process and really bring in HBCUs in our environment. So um, we have funding, for example, from the DOD for translational research that um, we've, you know, we, we sort of levered up um, in partnership with local HBCUs where we're helping them apply for similar funding and we're putting the equipment and the researchers on their campuses so that the talent that's there on those campuses, real talent, can actually be exposed to the kind of research and the kind of researcher um, and the kind of equipment you might see at an R1 university. And what we hope that will do is encourage more of those undergraduate students at the HBCUs to pursue graduate STEM education and to actually think about the concept of, of sort of engaging in innovation-driven entrepreneurship moving forward. And we think it's going to create a new, um, a new class of leadership. And hopefully that, I, I think that's a model that can be replicated at many other places as well. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Yael. And i um, excited to have you field a few more questions during our Q&A when we, when we wrap up the full group. Um, at this point, I'd like to tee up our next speaker, my friend and colleague, Vicki Gibbs. Vicki serves as the Executive Director of our Entrepreneurship Center at UNC Keenan Flagler Business School. Um, and as Greg mentioned, is, is the architect and, and brainchild of, of the Trends and Entrepreneurship Report. So Vicki, very excited to hand things over to you. Thanks so much, Mackenzie. Um, and I am very excited just to see the trends report and all of this research come together. So my name, Vicki Gibbs. Um, I'm the executive director for the Entrepreneurship Center at UNC Keenan Flagler. And we partner with Greg and the Keenan Institute of Private Enterprise on the Frontiers Conference and on the trends report. And one of the reasons that we brought that together is because you know we wanted there to be this source of truth that academia, industry, and policymakers could come to. And I have to say, like, after hearing just the speakers and my colleagues speak today, you know, I'm super excited to see things come to life. You know, some of the things that Yaya was talking about related to, you know, early education and early exposure relates directly to what Rodney Sampson, the next speaker, is going to be speaking about and his model of equity districts and exposure and socialization. That sort of when you talk about entrepreneurial ecosystems and really looking at that broadly, you know, how do we think about that in truly creating inclusive ecosystems? You have to start much earlier than traditionally we've done. 
So going a step back, so I come from the industry side. So I got a double E degree in the early 90s and graduated with my MBA in the late 90s. So right in the middle of the dot-com bust. And as a woman in high tech, in startups, you know, I lived, you know, that sort of uh, the my, being a minority in this field. And the it's real, but I would have to say that the involvement of um, academics, like the ones we have today, researching these subjects and really highlighting them has really shined a spotlight on this challenge of diversity and inclusivity within entrepreneurship. And now we are starting to see much more activity, really trying to create and actively move the needle with addressing some of these issues that were highlighted by David and others. So one of the things that we are talking about today at the Frontiers of Entrepreneurship Conference and a section of the Trends Report has to do with this subject of creating inclusive ecosystems. A piece of that is capital formation, which um, David and Greg are gonna be focused on in their session, and that is really important. But in order for an entrepreneur to be successful, it is not a solo sport. It is not just about capital. It is about all access to all of the other resources available. And the fact is, is that there is disparities in access across the board to those resources, not just capital. And when we talk about really breaking down systems that have been in place for a really long time, those take, they took time to develop and they're going to take time to break down. In our session today in the conference and in the report, we take a little bit different tact and we tee up the problem. The problem is recognized and the problem is covered in other areas in the report, but we also start to look at solutions. What you see today is we're seeing massive experimentation going on. And we've seen this for the past five or so years with definitely an uptick in some of this experimentation within the past year with the murder of George Floyd and the Black Lives Movement. And so what we are seeing is many different people, policymakers, academics, and also industry people who are actively creating solutions and models that we are, are being tested in the market today. So in our session and in the report, we start to break these things down. There's things related to community development. The SEC has introduced new regulations to basically widen things like crowdfunding, which especially during the pandemic was a large way that many entrepreneurs, especially minority entrepreneurs, were able to access capital. They actually, the SEC just opened that up. And at the beginning of April, was it March, right at the beginning of this year, they basically went from the amount that you could raise via crowdfunding went from 1 million to 5 million. So there are even other investment structure. So Backstage Capital, a VC firm that was started by Arlen Hamilton, they actually closed on a $5 million round as a direct result of that change in um, policy by the SEC. And now they are able to take those funds and deploy them to black and brown founders in the space who are doing amazing creative things. So in our session, we'll cover some of that policy. We're gonna look at communities. So Rodney Sampson, who you'll hear from in a second is gonna talk about what he's doing around equity districts. We're also going to look at entities like businesses and investors and things that are happening in that space investment entities that Arlen has developed with Backstage and that Rodney has developed with Black 100 Black Angels and Allies with a dual purpose, not just to create more money and capital access for Black and Brown founders, but also how do you create more wealth within Black communities for investors? So that is key for those. Then we'll also look at corporations and what they're doing. You know, we've seen this model around venture studios that has really exploded over the past five plus years. Venture studios is more than just an incubator or co-working space, but it's around how do corporations plug in and actually give startups access to not just mentorship, but also access to partners, access to customers. And we'll have Davion Ross, who's going to be on our panel, who is running a coalition venture studio for RGA. And so looking at how all of these models need to work together. And our hope is that by promoting some of these different models, some of these solutions, that the audience is going to be inspired and is going to learn things and be able to take those back into their own communities. So um, this is, you're gonna hear a lot more about it later today, but um, Mackenzie, I'll turn it back over to you.
That's great, Vicki, thank you so much. Um, I think we've got time for one quick question. You mentioned experimentation happening on a high level. Will the new working environment, work from home, flex hours, et cetera, present any new opportunities for entrepreneurs to provide solutions to companies charged with pivoting to this new landscape, the way the BLM movement is bringing new opportunities for minority entrepreneurs? So absolutely, I think, you know, when we started the pandemic, people were often talking about like, how do we go back to normal? And now I think that we've been in it for over a year. People are really starting to think through the new normal. And so I think what we're seeing as it relates to ecosystem, as we're relating to work from home, this is impacting real estate. It's impacting where people are working. I think it's also from an ecosystem perspective, providing a lot more opportunities as far as access to talent and access to capital which were really rooted in geographies, we're now seeing that explode. Um, I was actually um, speaking on a panel with an investor I was interviewing last summer, and they were about to hire their first CEO without ever meeting them in person, which was really scary starting out. But then it became, you know, we just had to get over those things, right? Yes, things will go back to being in person. Yes, people will, there is a need and there is a value in that but we are seeing a lot of evolution around not only like work from home and those elements, also a whole bunch of evolution in healthcare innovation. So I do think there is a lot more coming out. There's a lot more issues being highlighted. So for example, one of the things that will be highlighted in the healthcare innovation or in that section of the report is around how a lot of minority communities are not included in clinical trials. And there's actually, you know, a local startup, Clinispan, that is addressing that exact issue um, to try and get a more diverse group of people involved in clinical trials for COVID. So um, we're already starting to see that, and I think we will start to see that even more. Great. Thank you so much, Vicki. We're going to have time to field additional questions here shortly at the end of our press briefing. But at this point, I want to hand things over to our final speaker, Rodney Sampson. Rodney is the executive chairman and CEO of Opportunity Hub, or OHUB. He is also a non-resident senior fellow at the Brookings Institution. Uh, Rodney, welcome. Thank you for joining us. Good morning, uh, Mackenzie. It's exciting uh, to be here. I'm really excited about uh, participating um, today. Uh, so, uh, my contribution to the trends uh, report uh, was really focused on the importance of building inclusive entrepreneurship ecosystems in, for, uh, and by communities of color. Uh, this work was originally codified in research um, that was output as a guide um, in collaboration with the Federal Reserve Bank of Kansas City a couple years ago. And then last year, we signaled uh, a set of um, recommendations to cities in collaboration with the Brookings Institution um, on how to spur local economic recovery by increasing racial equity in local tech ecosystems. Um, you know, just uh, contextually uh, and, you know, from lived experience in 2000, um, I was the first uh, black founder to raise millions in venture capital in the South or actually the Southeast actually. Uh, that company was acquired in 2010 um, for eight figures. And by the way, we were never able to secure bank debt financing. The, the bank called uh, the day that they saw the news. <laughs> so after we were successful with the exit is when the bank wanted to, to lend to us. Um, you know, since that time, there have only been 300 black and brown founders to raise over $1 million in venture capital. Think about that, 300 in 21 years. Um, juxtapose that to 11,000 mostly non-Black firms who raised venture capital in 2019. Um, and the 2020 numbers appear to be even more dismal despite um, the increased flow of capital last year. Um, you know, and even the nascent traction that was experienced last year due to the murders of George Floyd, uh, Ahmaud Arbery, and Breonna Taylor and many more. Um, so why is this important? Well, you know, it may only represent 3% of the total investment capital stack in America, but it is literally the rocket fuel that is propelling thousands of companies that are now responsible for 60% of net new jobs. Um, and that's creating dais, as we call it, diversity, equity, inclusion solutions, is, is critical to increasing uh, the representation of Black, um, Latinx, and Indigenous people of color in the workforce. Um, trends um, we're seeing, um, which we signal in the report, um, it's good to see colleges, universities, think tanks like Brookings, 
um, tech companies, startups, VCs, and even ecosystem building organizations um, since last year have started to acknowledge the link between economic justice and social justice or economic dignity and, and social dignity. Um, we saw uh, some large corporations making large LP investments into black and brown uh, venture capital funds that are investing at the pre-seed, seed, and series A staging. So this model uh, is, is promising. Uh, the pandemic uh, also accelerated a redistribution of capital companies and talent from coastal ecosystems, such as Silicon Valley, New York, and Seattle, to cities like Austin, Miami, and Atlanta. Um, this is powering the development of new commercial, residential, and multi-use real estate developments that are now being branded as innovation districts. Um, many of these innovation districts have expressed an interest in building uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion solutions um, and equity districts into their developments. And equity districts um, deploy um, inside of the innovation districts early exposure programming, rapid upskilling via coding boot camps or software sales boot camps, intentional hiring partnerships, um, entrepreneurship support programs, accelerators, and venture capital specifically for the communities that the innovation um, districts are located in. So this is promising, but yet also necessary to ensure that we don't increase economic segregation, economic immobility, and gentrification that isn't inclusive of the communities that currently live in these neighborhoods. So operationalizing diversity, equity, and inclusion solutions across boards, talent, small business procurement, product development, go-to-market, investment, and impact throughout the technology startup and venture ecosystem. Um, as we speed into the fourth industrial revolution at scale is critical to creating um, true racial equity and parity in um, society. So while most of the acknowledgements and commitments to date have been admirable, uh, they still aren't enough if you wanna close the skills gap, the jobs gap, um, and the racial uh, wealth gap in our country. We must build density. Thank you for listening. Thank you so much, Rodney. That's fantastic. Um, we got a great question tying back to the trends report. Um, this person says the trends report says that fintech played a key role during the pandemic, particularly in providing assistance to underrepresented communities. Why do you think that was? And do you think that the trend will continue? If so, what impact will that have on traditional banks? You know, that's a that's a that's a great that's a great question. Um, I think you know the the data kind of borrowed this from Janelle Monet, but the, the data don't lie. And so when you look at the uh, distribution of technology, especially mobile technology in socially disadvantaged communities, um, you know, in, in, in these socially disadvantaged communities, there may be there are more mobile phones than their desktop computers or, or laptops. So um, when uh, when people think about the technologies, uh, the neo banks that have come online, like First Boulevard um, and others, um, they are also targeting these communities. And you know, we talk about this in our, our dais, and we'll talk about it in the dais certificate at UNC Chapel Hill this fall. But you have to be intentional about marketing to those communities. And that's so. In the past, banks have just kind of done, you know, general marketing and not really thought about how to specifically talk to customers. And these new neo banks are doing that. That's a great answer, Rodney. Thank you so much. At this point, we're going to open things up for a question or two with our full group. I know we are running a, a bit tight on time, um, but want to open things back up to our, our full, full panel of experts for a couple of questions that have come in. So let me pull those up real quickly. All right. Okay. Um, up, up, uh, Sorry, we've had a lot of questions come in and I'm trying to sort through them. Uh, this is a great one to start with. In the report, expert Sandra Moore talks about the cost of replacing an employee, things like lost productivity, recruitment cost, and onboarding. With so many small businesses faced with needing to hire new employees to replace those lost during the pandemic, what do you think the economic impact will be? I'll open that up for the group. I think the answer to that question really hinges critically on how many people re-enter the labor market. The, uh, we, we saw people have spent a lot of time talking about the 
change in the unemployment rate, but the unemployment rate does not factor in the people who have exited the labor force. And as economic conditions improve, I think we're going to see people re-enter the labor force. And the, the, the extent to which ha- their proportion and the composition of, of, for, of people entering new jobs is going to tell us a lot about the, the costs of, you know, bringing people up to speed um, in terms of skills and, and productivity. I'll just throw in a quick comment. I mean, I, really one of the basic ideas behind PPP was to keep uh, employees connected to businesses just because of those frictions of, of you know, people being terminated and having to hire back and retrain people. I, I think that was successful in some businesses that were able to rebound last summer, but you look at other industries where things you know, were shut down for a very long period of time, there's been more permanent separation of employees. And you know, it's, so it's a double whammy. So not only were those businesses harder hit, but they're also going to have uh, steeper startup costs when um, you know, they, they start to return um, operations to what they look like pre-pandemic. So, um, I mean, I think it is a, a serious issue. You know, the extent of it, um, I, I don't think we'll know until we get further into the recovery and more of these um, non-essential businesses are trying to go back to full scale. I think one of the unintended side effects of PPP, and I think this is something we're going to touch on later in the over the next two days, is that it it encouraged it encouraged stagnation, and so we can talk a lot about the cost of bringing pe- um, you, you know re- reskilling employees that are that are going back into the labor force, but there are going to be lots of people who have held on to a job that is not a long term not their long-term job and they're going to be jumping from one job to another. And, and, and those are costs that those are adjustment costs that we're also going to face. And I think those adjustment costs were probably exacerbated by PPP. Uh, The other thing I wanted to add is I think there's just, just reiterate, there's just a lot of unknowns right now. Like you saw an unprecedented number of women leave the workforce just because of work from home, school from home, and all of that sort of thing. You saw disparities in different communities, especially communities of color get impacted just by COVID. And then we've also seen a rise in necessity entrepreneurs. So those that lost their job and opened their own business. And so I think you're gonna, all of these things, people are going to have personal decisions to make about what they do during this next season. And I think flexibility in the workforce, you know, not just where you work, but potentially how you work full-time, part-time, um, structured. I think all of there's gonna be pressures in all of those. And then how do you actually create this new work environment and culture um, when you also may have remote employees that you didn't have before? And so I, I think there's a lot of learning to be had and with learning there is cost, but I think the companies that are able to, to iterate on that more quickly um, and experiment and be more flexible will be the ones who end up, um, I think, winning and getting the talent that is going to be available. That's great. Thank you so much. I know that we are right at time and I hate that we didn't get a chance to respond to all of the terrific questions submitted, but I just want to thank all of our experts again for sharing their insights um, and their time. And I want to thank all of our participants for joining us today as well. Um, A reminder that we are scooting over to our uh, 2021 Keenan Institute Frontiers of Entrepreneurship Conference at this point. Uh, That conference does begin at 11 a.m. Eastern. Uh, Registration this year is free. It's the first time we've gone digital, so you can find the link to register Um, in the chat below. Uh, We hope that you'll be able to join us there and of course invite you to learn more. Check out the report in full at frontiers.unc.edu. If you would like to continue the conversation with any of our experts individually, you can reach out to me. My email address is mckenzie underscore bab at keenan-flagler.unc.edu and I'd be happy to make those connections. 